Welcome, everybody. My name is Neil Bridges. I'm the Chief Content Officer for INE.com. I'm also a cybersecurity influencer and a former hacker with the National Security Agency. I am so thrilled today to be joined uh, by Clayton Chandler, CISO for Credit Suisse's Investment Bank. Uh, Clayton, you want to take a few minutes to uh, introduce yourself to the audience today? Yeah, Neil, very, very happy to be here. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of Credit Suisse, we're a large multinational wealth manager and investment bank headquartered in Zurich. Um, I'm in New York. Um, for a lot of years, I was the global head of cybersecurity, engineering, and operations for the firm. Um, over the past year, I've been uh, the chief information security officer for our investment bank. Um, and much like Neil, my background, um, you know, I kind of came up through the NSA system, um, you know, delivered, you know, large um, you know, high performance computing systems and ran a bunch of data teams and did a whole bunch of stuff. And, um, you know, really, really happy to be here and talking about uh, resiliency. Awesome. Let's since you brought up resiliency, let let let's do jump right into resiliency, right? I think it is completely safe to say that resilience in some way, shape, or form has been in the news a lot. And I think even putting it a lot is an understatement. Not just recently, but within the last year. And I think some would argue that the cybersecurity challenges spurred by COVID-19 pandemic has made resilience way less of a buzzword and way more of a common topic. And I just want to read a quote for you here real quick before I ask you a question. The RSA CEO, uh, Rohit Guy, during his opening speech for RSA 2021 said, and I quote, resilience isn't just about getting up when you fall. To be good at it, we must fall less often. Yep. How have you seen the role of resilience evolve over the last 14 months, you know, especially during the pandemic? No, I think that's absolutely right. I think there's two key aspects to this that are because people ask all the time what what is what is resilience why is this a new and different thing than what we did in the past where maybe historically you had you know some combination of cybersecurity identification protection detection and response along with traditional business continuity management concepts like you know recovery time objectives and you say look if this is all about recovering what why why is this a new thing and and to go back to the rsa quote you know the, i think the way that we've approached it is look you, you are going to fall down. Um, are, are you prepared for when you fall down? And I think maybe one thing that, that's, that's a bit unique about resilience is it's not even so much how, how fast do you need to get up to, in order to resume your operations. It's, well, can you conduct your operations when you've fallen down? What would that look like from a, from a business process perspective? You know, so, so there's, there's a lot of, I think, nuance underneath that, that term of, of resilience in terms of what it really means. Um, but absolutely, uh, over the past 12 to 14 months, um, it, it's really caused a lot of changes and additions to what you know organizations like ours do in terms of preparedness, simulations, really understanding your front-to-back business processes and, and the critical paths in those processes through different applications or pieces of infrastructure. And I think the biggest change has been, look, if, as I mentioned earlier, those more traditional um, BCM style concepts, or uh, let's call them cyber incident response concepts, were really around bespoke applications or pieces of infrastructure or even employees. You know, when we think about resilience, we're really talking about the full front to back value chain from, you know, the, the, the business facing side of the organization all the way back to core infrastructure, such as, you know, Active Directory and identity. And, you know, that is the thing that you're setting an impact tolerance for, that you're designing cyber scenarios for, that you're testing. Um, and, and I think that, you know, modified flight plane for the thing that we're trying to protect is, I think that's the difference. And that's the thing that's sort of new and unique when we talk about resiliency versus, again, you know, some of the terms and, and concepts we were using a couple of years ago. When, when we when we think about resiliency, I want to I want to kind of pick on something you just said there, right? You talked about resiliency being a nuance. If you had to kind of identify three, you know, short title topic ideas for the audience to take away to remember about resiliency, what would kind of be those three things that make you resiliency, especially in the cybersecurity space, probably different than what they're used to, which is resiliency in the the physical security or the the true crisis management type of recovery? Sure. Uh Maybe maybe I'll kind of tackle it um, kind of chronologically as you go through go through the process of really defining your resiliency and then testing it. I mean, the you know I, mean, I guess to kind of take a step back as a global financial services institution, we're obviously you know 
very heavily, heavily regulated. I mean, you, you see papers from, you know, BCBS or the PRA or, or more recently the, the Fed here in the U.S. that are, you know, describing concepts for operational resiliency. Um, we've obviously done very thorough analysis and, 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 and gap analysis of those. And, and it really starts with, you know, number one, saying an impact tolerance. Um, that's, that's really, that's really new, right? And, and if you take, for example, you know, what is our impact tolerance for one of our key, um, business lines here, here in the Americas? Um, maybe that's again, as a, um, uh, you know, broker dealer, maybe that that's our prime services business. Where we're providing services to institutional clients and we need to set a very specific quantified impact tolerance for just how much can we withstand before we reach some level of, of critical mass in terms of disruption, not just to our bank, but disruption to, you know, the, the, the critical infrastructure of the global financial services system. And again, that, that impact tolerance definition, it's not an application specific definition, like a, like, like a, like a recovery time objective. And it, it's right. not an infrastructure um, definition, you know, again, traditionally, maybe we're talking about life cycle management. It, it's look, we're looking at the full front to back value chain. And if you talk about a data corruption attack, that that the way that that corrupted data could flow front to back and you say okay we're now going to move into the next step of this that i'll talk about in a second which is defining a scenario and testing it but really reasoning about this object that is that that full front to back data flow that that unit um as opposed to an employee an individual piece of infrastructure an individual application the first i think big change um is is the ability for you to define inventory and understand those front to back business processes as a you know inventoried object that you're trying to protect the same way that a piece of infrastructure is um and the second one's around a scenario and and i think we'll probably talk a little bit later about um how you know the role like what role does the CISO play or what role does cybersecurity you know operations and engineering play in um in you know kind of operational resilience and I think this is one where um, if you look at, uh, you know, our um, red teaming functions or control effectiveness functions or other, you know, proactive means by which we um, quantify our own, you know, control effectiveness. Um, and we say, hey, look, there is a, a data corruption scenario, malware scenario, distributed denial of service scenario. And we need to understand as we kind of crawl the tree of impact mm -hmm. and we need to kind of simulate that. What does that scenario look like how do we how do we model that scenario and how do we how do we describe it right so again you know if you think about kind of coming from the the cybersecurity world of you know using miter attack or using the diamond model or the cyber curl chain to sort of articulate cyber scenarios that that then coming into more of a what is more of a traditional kind of business continuity management ecosystem to again to give that additional depth to Again, we're not talking about something that's much more coarse grain. This isn't loss of data center or loss of application. This is right. an end-to-end -end set of you know techniques, tactics, and procedures that cause this impact on the applications that that provide this business service. So I think the second big one is the depth with which scenarios are defined and and ultimately tested. Again, the the third one being the depth of testing. Um, you know, it's interesting when. When we have discussions uh, with our peer organizations, and then there's people have arrived at operational resilience from very different places. If you if you pull the audience um, in some type of industry forum on the resilience topic, you'll get um, a lot of people coming from BCM. You'll get a lot of people coming from you know some firms have stood up kind of bespoke operational resilience organizations, and you get people that have come from cybersecurity. Um, and again, I think what cybersecurity is providing there is when we're talking about testing. Uh, this is not the traditional over the weekend, pull the plug and make sure all of our applications still run because they fill it over to the other right. data center thing. Right. This is right. something along the lines of, of red teaming, right? And and again, a very new concept to the kind of BCM side of the house, but that's one of those um, methodologies that, that the cyber folks are, are, are bringing to the table. Well, and, and I, I wanna put a finer point on that because I wanna make sure that, that everybody heard that, right? Is is BCP now, resiliency now, like testing your disaster recovery plans, just testing in general, is vastly different than it was when, I, I like how you put that, you just simply pull the plug on something and watch it fail over to your alternative data center or, or, or whatever, the, or your disaster recovery location. And I think that that's lost on some some folks to understand that that's, that's no longer how we're measuring resilience these days. Yeah, and there's a, you know, it, 
one of the other groups that that's really represented in these discussions is um, data organizations, maybe a mm -hmm. chief data officer or someone along those lines. Because if you think about it, again, you know, kind of talking specifically about financial services for a minute, applications, because we weren't, we being an industry, um, weren't designing our applications to be resilient necessarily to, you know, these types of, um, you know, front to back data corruptions, just to go back to that example, it, it we were des you, know, you design applications against the controls that you test, and we're testing for loss of data center. We're, we're, we're testing for, um, uh, again, from a more of a cyber perspective, if your internet facing, you know, uh, what, what's your risk of things like SQL injection? But but we're mm -hmm. not we're not testing. Hey, what the hell happens if you ingest corrupted data, right? So there's <laughs> a, you know, if you think about these large multinational organizations and that run thousands of applications, and now you start introducing this concept of resiliency, I hope people appreciate that that's not just changing the way you test or you know setting these new terms like impact tolerance that has a fundamental step change in the way that you need to think about designing your applications to be resilient to these types of things that could be coming into them from from upstream so 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 you, you're right we are going to talk a little bit about the operational side of um you know resiliency and testing um you know red teaming and things like that a little bit on i want to focus a little bit more real quick on, on some of that, an aspect of that data corruption and an aspect of some of the new ways that we're finding out about resiliency testing. And I think the most notable topic that I think anybody talks about, especially in the last 14 months, when we look across the, the scope of cyberspace the last 14 months, has been ransomware. And, and it's been without a doubt reached brand new heights as probably the most prominent cybersecurity threat to almost every organization, regardless of, of, of vertical. Um, we've seen organizations as large as Cognizant incur a fifty million dollar, you know, you know, cost increase. TravelX, which is the fourth, you know, was fourth largest ransomware attack in twenty twenty, paid a two point three million dollar ransom. Um, it, you know, we've seen the the global GPS of millions of subscribers disrupted by the Garmin falling victim to ransomware. The stats on ransomware just keep going up. So when we talk about testing, we talk about scenarios, and we talk about companies building resiliency. Ransomware clearly is the biggest That's test right. of a company's business and continuity and disaster recovery capabilities. Why are companies still failing it, though? Well, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, I, I want to touch about, you know, the, the role, again, kind of going back to the folks that are kind of attending this. And, you know, what are you as a cyber practitioner, what role do you play in kind of resiliency? And, and I think ransomware is a great example, right, where, you know, we in cyber have a multi-year history of taking this thing called a ransomware attack and breaking it down into its constituent components, understanding intrusion vectors, understanding you know things like lateral movement, understanding the vulnerabilities that could be exploited, and again, if we're kind of then pivoting our chair and going into the more traditional you know BCP ecosystem, those are all new concepts to them, right? Um, and and you know in terms of why they keep failing, I guess let me talk about third party for a minute. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to pivot um, because I, I can talk to you about recent experiences and yeah, I, I think the challenge that a lot of organizations have, um, if we look at um, solar winds or, you know, the Microsoft exchange vulnerability, which wasn't, wasn't necessarily ransomware um, or the cognizant attack. It's, it's how do you have like, to what degree can you have a scalable, systematically repeatable means to introspect the control environment of your third party providers and their providers? And how do you have a means of very quickly and readily understanding the engagement mode that you have with that supplier? That is, you know, is this a mode wherein your data is in their data center? Are they coming onto your premises, et cetera? And I think, you know, the thing that's really still developing is what is the right means by which you continuously monitor for exposure to not only ransomware, but other attacks, but I think, I think ransomware is the most relevant here. Um, mm -hmm. What is the scalable solution to continuous monitoring of ransomware exposure through your supply chain? Now, mm -hmm. I think, I think where we are as an industry from a, from a response perspective, right? So let's assume that something has happened or has potentially happened. You know, we, I think we're reasonably good at finding out about it through either, um, you know, exercises where and we confirm with our critical providers how they notify us, kind of rationalized through through threat intelligence and, and kind of independent awareness. Um, we're reasonably good at um, understanding who our critical providers are, 
Um, and again, kind of rationalizing that signal of, of are they potentially impacted by this ransomware event based on, you know, there's a number of, of solutions that do things like monitor public internet, you know, NetFlow to look for signatures of vulnerabilities, you know, again, Microsoft Exchange, hey, is it is it is it speaking, um, you know, webmail over port 443 and it's critical provider, okay, hey, heads up, right? Um, but what I think we really need to mature in, again, we being an industry, is like I said, kind of a priori, what if you could imagine your your network operations center um, and, and to a lesser extent your security operations center where you generally have a a live look down at you know the the kind of goings on within the environment from a from a you know net flow traffic event logging perspective that's extremely fine grain and you compare that with I'll say where most organizations are in terms of their supply chain monitoring which is either um, only done at contract time from some kind of TPRM questionnaire, or you know they have some type of vendor reputation scoring system that they're kind of continuously monitoring, but they in a very very coarse grain view of the provider. Um, you know, so how do you how do you identify quickly that potential exposure to ransomware? So I, I think that's the biggest one where where we we as an again you know uh, a, a practice right have some have some maturing to do again, but it has to be scalable. I mean you can't you can't you're not going to get the vulnerability report from a thousand different vendors every day, right? Right. So there's got to be some way of having a scalable solution, yet having a reasonable understanding of that supply chain attack surface. Well, and that's and that's actually what I was going to try to draw a finer point to. And I was going to we're probably going to probably going to upset some of the the pen testers or red teamers with this next question, this next answer. But wait a minute, I thought I thought this type of testing, this is exactly what my red teamers and this is exactly what my pen testers are supposed to be doing for me. I mean, they're testing this stuff every year. I mean, at best, they might be testing it every quarter if you've got that kind of team. But why is it that we can't rely on those types of testing mechanisms, particularly in the third yeah. parties, to be able to provide us with that resiliency or assurance? I, I, I think it's a, I think there's a lack of a systematic trigger for that style of testing. Look, I, I don't think there's fundamental flaws in the practice of pen testing or the practice of red teaming. Um, I, I think the... If there's a flaw, kind of in industry wide, in 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 this area, it, it's how do we how do you have the visibility such that you know that you need to trigger a retest? So I think a good example is again going back to third party, and we're talking about you know SaaS applications and and pretty much everything that you're going to procure as a large organization now it's got some kind of SaaS backend, right? And um, if you think about if you kind of go back to the on-prem ecosystem, you've probably got some kind a software development framework that's got various toll gates, you know, even if you're using Agile and not Waterfall, where your security architecture team, your CISO team, your, you know, potentially your red team, they, 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 they've got a gate, they go and do an analysis, they do it either, you know, pre kind of build time or they do it post deployment time. You don't have that level of introspection into a SaaS. It's on the other side of a service that you're contractually, you know, getting into with your provider. So, Again, whether that's, um, you know, your collaboration tooling provider, i.e. maybe a Microsoft or a Zoom or someone like that, um, and they've got some, you know, fundamental feature enhancement or improvement that's going into the SaaS platform. Do you know when you need to pen test, right? What is the right frequency to pen test when you've got relatively live, you know, CI, CD pipelines happening on the, on the, on the other side of these SaaS platforms? So, again, I mean, I'm not trying to beat kind of the dead horse when it comes to supply chain, but I, I think it's a, it's a lack of... It's a lack of scalable visibility into changes in the control landscape of the supply chain. And um, again, I, I, you know, I think yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think that that's I think that that's the perfect synopsis of it, though, right? It is that that lack of scalability in that changing landscape that makes those strategies much yeah. more complicated. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, I want to I want to pick on I want to pick on. Um, uh, something you'd said earlier, you'd mentioned the regulatory bodies. And you'd mentioned how you get, you all were incredibly regulated as well. Um, I always ask this whenever we bring up regulation because there's there's all sorts of mixed feelings when it comes to regulation. Do you think regulatory bodies such as NYDFS, PCI Council, FFIC, you know, et cetera, are helping, hindering, or supporting companies in their resiliency strategies? That's a really good question, and I think you'll get a lot of different responses to that when you, when you talk to different organizations. I'll, I'll give you my perspective, um, and maybe I'll take a step back and just give an overall perspective on, on you know, what we're seeing in terms of the regulatory environment um, that I think anyone that's in a regulated industry on this, on this you know, conference would agree with is 
yes, we're seeing a global move towards more prescriptive regulation um, and more finer grain questioning of your control environment. And, and what I mean by, by those two questions is where in the past um, you would articulate to the regulator your, hey, look, this is our risk and control framework. This is how we manage risk. This is how we monitor the effectiveness of controls. You know, we may or may not decide to do X, Y, or Z with that control based on our, our risk appetite for that particular type of risk. Um, and the same thing with, let's say, um, how your information security controls are operated. So as an example, maybe, um, you know, you're kind of a, a mid-sized organization and you have an, an outsourced MSSP for your security operations center. And, and that's the conversation that you're having with that particular regulator. And, you know, in terms of what happens on the other side of that MSSP relationship, you, you maybe traditionally didn't get questions about that. Like your ability to, hey, there's this particular type of threat. I, the regulator, now have the ability to speak MITRE attack to you. And I'm asking you about a particular, you know, element of the matrix. Do you have detection logic for that type of threat? I, you wouldn't have gotten that question six or seven years ago. No. You're no. getting that question now. Um, and, and, you know, I think the other one I mentioned is, is being prescriptive. And I think you'll get a lot of divergent response on, you know, the prescriptive nature of regulation and kind of what it means for the industry. I, I guess mine is irrespective of my of my personal feelings on um you know are we, are we overstepping into regulatory solutionizing i i understand where it's coming from and so what i mean is again if you look at you know the mydfs 500 regulation that's got some really prescriptive elements to it um, again some of the um, again, operational resilience kind of white papers that will very likely lead to kind of forthcoming regulation. Again, very, very specific language around things like, um, you know, data recovery solutions or the, the amount of time you need to store security audit trails. If a regulator decides to take an, an, an opinion of, look, we believe that this function you are providing or this business you are in, this function you're providing to the national Financial, in our case, financial services, but the national, you know, critical infrastructure ecosystem, which you know, financial services is considered critical infrastructure. Look, we we think it's systemically important, and therefore we're going to prescribe that you raise the bar in terms of your cyber resiliency. I get that. I get where they're coming from, right? So, mm -hmm. so again, I, I it, you know, I, I think it's a balancing act. I think the regulators would say it's a balancing act. I don't think they're trying to compel you to. To, to deliver specific type of technology, but I understand the perspective of protecting um, what they believe to be systemically important assets. That that it's good that you bring up the critical infrastructure piece. Um, I want to I want to use critical infrastructure kind of in my next question for you, um, and, and honestly, just because it's it's recently been in the news and it does give us a lot of opportunity to talk about you know resiliency as it relates to critical infrastructure, which is you know, obviously something that is, is of a concern to, to a lot of, you know, organizations in the financial services. Um, but I want to pivot it a little bit and talk about cyber insurance, which I, I know is always everybody's most fun topic, right? And it's it's long been used as a risk deterrence for many, many organizations in their resiliency strategy. I know that I've done tons of cyber uh, insurance engagements and, you know, the amount of, of comfort and risk deference that a lot of organizations get when you start talking cyber insurance is, it is mind-blowingly. And recently with the, the $4.4 million fine that Colonial Pipe had paid for the, its ransom, the French-based AXA has brazenly stated that they would no longer support ransomware claims uh, for cyber insurance as well. How do you think this should change how organizations view their BCPDR strategy if we see that dynamic applied to the, the broader cyber, cyber insurance industry? Uh, I think that's a, that's a very um, dynamic environment right now that is evolving very quickly. Um, you know, much like you, I've been in a number of, of cyber insurance conversations over the past several years, and, and I've seen the, the, the dynamic change. I guess what I would say is, is if I, you know, I, I talk with, you know, you know, peers that are kind of helping support the, the cyber insurance underwriting process or otherwise engaged in that ecosystem, maybe, maybe the answer is it's the, when, when people are thinking about cyber insurance, whether you're on, you know, the insurer side or whether you're on the insured side, Moving away from from any thought or methodology that again, if I'm if I'm visualizing here for a minute, and you've got your 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 controls here, and then you've got cyber insurance as this kind of catch-all underneath it, I think people are you know that's not necessarily the right approach, right? Of of you know it, it's this thing that sort of it, it's a, it's the last layer of our defense in depth. I, I think it's more of a it's more of a vertical than it is that sort of horizontal that stretches across everything. And in that 
in that transition to it becoming a vertical, uh, I think a lot more, I think a lot of, again, on, on both sides of the insurance world are, are additional telemetry, you know, finer grain understanding of, um, from the insurer's perspective, the thing you are insuring, and then finer grain perspective from the insured side of what exactly is insured. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think it continues to become finer grain. Um, but I, I'm also very curious to see over the next three or four years, because um, I don't think anybody expects a, a slowdown in this type of activity that's going to lead to claims, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, what is this really going to mean for some fundamental changes to the to the cyber insurance, um, you know, world? I don't I don't know. We'll see. I I think an interesting an interesting conversation around this whole topic when we talk about cyber insurance, and and you mentioned this a little bit when we when we hit on the regulator part was the the continued maturity of regulators to stay up to date with not only the latest threats, but also the latest controls and mitigations that kind of go with it. Do you think that we're going to see that same level of maturity in the yes. cyber insurance at a rate that's commensurate? Yes. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, again, you know, I know that financial services in some sense is, is kind of a leading indicator of this just because of the significant amount of scrutiny that we have. But um, again, you know, not necessarily speaking on behalf of Credit Suisse, but just talking about, you know, cyber and financial services in general, when a, Colonial pipeline happens, or Microsoft Exchange happens, or Solar Winds, or Cognizant. Um, the the rate with which we get a request for a let's say position or response from a from a regulator, um, and the detail of the questions that they're asking with regard to that response. Um, and again, imagine you're transitioning from a uh, hey, you know, were you guys impacted by this? To take it down. You know, we understand these were the TTPs that were used. Do you guys have defenses in place for this? Um, seeing that on the on, on the insurance side as well. Yes, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. I want to bring that's a lot of outside. I want to bring it back inside to security organizations, just inside your own CISO organization or just CISO organizations as a whole across FS or, or cybersecurity. There, there is no substitute for experience. Um, however, there has been a lot of talk from professionals that believe that our best practices is what is causing a lot of these breaches. And yes, I'm bringing up the Hill article. No, not the Hill article. Uh, I know, I know, I know. But it's, you know, every time something hits the news, it gives us a great opportunity to shine a light on these topics and really bring them to light. And so just a refresher for folks who may have been living under a rock and didn't see the Hill article, right? You know, they say that the Colonial Pipeline breach was because some individual or group was able to hack through cyber best practices, sites that CISSP, bachelor's and master's programs, make cybersecurity members impressively credentialed professionals skilled in the arts of tedium that some <laughs> professionals are paper pushers um and that the good guys are prevented from having a holistic view of the system but in right. his view the good guys are the it admins and then finally but absolutely not least uh that industry best practices are not best practices but dangerous practices. And so Clayton, I want to ask you, do you think that there's a disconnect between what we in the industry deem as best practices and what actually happens in the trenches of cyber defense? That's a lot to unpack. Um, yeah. So, so let me, let me kind of, kind of take it back up to just, but, but I, I'm going to get into the Hill article. Um, okay. uh, I, I, you know, there were, there, there's plenty in that article that not just me, but every single person that's read it, that's listening to this goes, that that's just that's just nonsense right um we're not going to talk yeah. about you know incidents and firing staff and all that we'll we'll set that aside um uh, it's the reason i left that one out <laughs> <laughs> so but 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 now let me get back to let me get back to this topic and and again another caveat that this is this is one you know one man one 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 practitioner's opinion i do think at a surface level there is something to be said for the practice of cyber defense if there's this, there, there's this spectrum, and on this side of the spectrum, you've got what I'll call governance, risk, and compliance, right? You've got a very traditional risk assessment process that is largely maybe questionnaire-based or, um, you know, data analysis-based. Um, and then on, on you know, the, the far right of that spectrum, you've got a far more fine grain, empirical, uh, approach to understanding control effectiveness through proactive red teaming and control testing. So there, there's the spectrum, mm -hmm. I think, right? And, and I do think that there is something to be said about the need for us as cyber practitioners, again, just 
you know, hey, like I said, one man's opinion, and I grew up a developer, so I'm kind of biased because, you know, I, I kind of live over here, right? Um, <laughs> I, I, I think we need to, you know, our best practices as codified in things like the CISSP, et cetera, I think we should start moving a little bit to the right and kind of compelling individuals to move a little bit to the right of that spectrum. And um, look, if you're going to assess the information security of an application and approach number one is, hey, you're going to comb through um, NIST 853 and ask a question of the application team of each of those controls and get them to respond to you how they do it, to no, we're going to collect empirical evidence of control effectiveness through um, uh, you know, organized penetration testing slash red teaming. I do think we need to move to the right. Now, I think you need to do it in a controlled way. Um, I think you need to do it in a, in a risk managed way. Again, that's another area where I, I think I, I disagree with the Hill article. You can't just let all hell break loose in, in, in production, right. Um, right. despite what Netflix says. And, um, <laughs> uh, but, but so again, lar- and largely I, I kind of scoff at the article, but I, I don't disagree with the thesis of taking information security best practices and pushing them into more of a deeper technical empirical validation based set of practices is is it fair to say that i think i think what i'm hearing you say is that we've let the pendulum swing too far to the left to say the grc side where we rely too heavily in most cases again there's there's some some obviously some exceptions to that rule that that's a comment that's going to upset a lot of people but we've we've allowed the industry to lean more heavily to the grc side than to the real world experience or the real world, you know, you know, activities that are happening in the SOC, in the NOC, in the actual boots on the ground in a security. Well, and I'll just add, I I mean, and and Neil, sorry to cut you off, but I would also add within the application teams themselves. I mean, the other, when I say, you know, we, we need to, I think, move a little bit towards a, a deeper form of, of control validation. Um, I I was in a, in a workshop a couple of years ago and, um, I heard a really good analogy for, um, you know, how to tackle this. And the analogy, and others may have heard it, um, was, you know, the federal, the state, and the city police. And and historically, within an organization, you've got, let's call them cities, which are your application teams. And there was this big monolithic fed, right? Like the SOC is your fed. Here's the feds, right? And all the logs are going to the central place and we've got detection logic and, you know, we're running our access management controls and, you know, we're the ones with our questionnaires. And if you get out of line, we're going to give you a risk and you have a one year action plan to mitigate it. And, 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 and the feds are watching and I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting PTSD from that. <laughs> Sorry right about here. that, man. <laughs> but, but so when I say, you know, we need to, we need to go a bit deeper. It, it the, the, we, the, we isn't necessarily just the feds. What, what I mean is uh, to use the cliche of push left, you know, we need to, some of those responsibilities need to fall into the hands of the city police, i.e. the application teams themselves, and the state police, which are maybe those, those lines of business and their, and their CIO. You know, I could point to things like vulnerability management, secure configuration management, um, auditing and logging. Now, it, is there a role for the feds? Well, hell yeah, there's a role for the feds, right? But but again, I think the whole practice um, would benefit from, from, I think, thinking about it more as empirical validation and not... Um, uh, and I'm going to you know, upset a lot of people. Um, administration. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm, mm. No, keep keep going. That, that's that's a good li- that's a good line to be on because I, if we're going to upset some people, let's upset <laughs> some people. I mean, you know, because 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 here's what's going to happen, right? You've got the the sock or the feds in your analogy who now are going to push back on you and say, but how do we how do we write policy or how do we write enforcements that the city and and local police to continue on your analogy. Um, are actually capable of of doing their own governance and oversight and enforcement on topics that have traditionally been the responsibility of the SOC or the CISO organization. No, that's a really good point, and 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 I, I think this is what a lot of organizations are trying to solve for right now. Where, like, I'm gonna I'll use a, a specific control to to try to kind of um, clarify, right? So so if we take vulnerability management as an example, I think everybody would agree that you don't want to live in a world where the feds and their broad network scanner based vulnerability scans are the thing that kicks off your lifecycle management activity. Like, Hey, the Mm -hmm. feds have discovered that you're running deprecated SSH settings. You need to go patch that. 
Now, it's the it's the quality assurance function that sweeps everything up at the end. I'm not saying you stop doing that, but that accountability um, for delivering secure applications on top of secure infrastructure should start with the whole the the kickoff of that process should be things that happen at at at, at build time at code time, right? Um, but I'm not necessarily like the feds don't have a role here in you know, you still need holistic visibility into the ecosystem and the ability, you know, through your policy obligations to go enforce those. But maybe think of it more as a, a monitoring and quality assurance function, at least for that specific control, than the trigger for the enterprise process. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I think I think we've we've covered a, a, a large range of things from from you know the supply chain, the disparity, um, you know, just just the holistic view across the organization, the the role of the 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 SOC and the cyber defense, and how we need to figure out which way we need to move left or right when it comes to that. I want to kind of bring this back around to um, something you'd said earlier on, but something that 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 I want to share and want to get your opinion on as well. You know, um, having you know been a former NSA hacker, built numerous red teams throughout my career, I've spent a lot of time trying to hack organizations the exact same way hackers do. Um, you kind of hit it on this a little bit when we talked about pen testers and red teams. There is only so much time and effort that that I or anybody from my pen testing team that I've built in the past can put into it. Yep. Within the last year, I've had a chance to deep dive in breach and attack simulation, kind of the space as a whole. And my feelings, when I look back at my pen testing career, my red teaming career, even vulnerability discovery or compliance checks, um, Gosh, if I could have had this back then and built an, an entire practice with breach and attack simulation, the amount of work that I could have accelerated, the amount of work I could have got done, you know, how much this could have just transformed some of the industries that I've that I've worked in. Um, I know yep. that when I look back on that, I'm 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 amazed by it. How do you see breach and attack simulation in modern red teams, socks, and just the CISO sure. organization as a whole? A, a great topic, especially for the folks on this call. Um, I, look, I mean, two. I think my organization, you know, plays. I think there, there's really two key roles that a breach and attack simulation plays. That that's really benefited our organization. And I am gonna, for one of these answers, dive back into the GRC side of CISO and um, hopefully make those folks a little happier than I did five minutes ago. So, so one of the <laughs> things, one of the things that we have to do, again, as a as a as a regulated, you know, financial services entity, um, for those of you that are familiar with kind of big multinational banks, is we have to hold capital to um, provide a buffer against particular forms of risk. And this has a breach of tech simulation bent to it, I promise. Um, so please don't go to sleep, people. <laughs> so, so whereas maybe five years ago, for the operational risk, part of that capital allocation equation, you would have had a very heuristic approach to the process. So for the, for the cyber part of that, you may have said, hey, Heuristically, what what is the worst breach we've ever seen in financial services? And we'll model that as the worst case scenario, and then we'll kind of work our bait back from that. What what breach and attack simulation has provided to that side of the CISO the, the the CISO ecosystem is we're no longer using a heuristic model for that capital allocation process. We take we take our controls, we take the effectiveness of those controls as quantified. Um, through these types of solutions. We then feed that up to our partners in the risk organization to, when they're running these models, to determine, um, you know, uh, again, the, the amount of capital to hold on, on behalf of an operational risk, you know, slash cyber attack. It's based on real data. And we would have never been able to scale that process without the assistance of, one, um, you know, things like uh, MITRE attack as a methodology, period. And then two, the kind of you know enhancement and automation and scalability of that through breach and attack simulation products. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, um, for a financial services company, if if you can move to that quantitative versus heuristic model, and that results in requiring less capital to hold, you've now made cybersecurity a bottom line profit yes. center versus cost center conversation, right? Now, which yep. is which, which, which for those who are listening is incredibly valuable to us. It's something yep. we've we've rarely been able to achieve in this industry. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and the other side of it is much more on the operational side. So, um, you know, look with the sheer number of applications, with the significantly increased rate with which those applications are changing, both internally and I mentioned, you know, external applications earlier. The ability to, if you want to take that empirical validation-based approach to control effectiveness testing 
and scale it. It, it, I, I think you know there's a um, there's a role absolutely for for breach and attack simulation in that world. Else we just can't we just can't keep up. Awesome, um, Clayton. Listen, that that's it for my questions. Um, you have been a fantastic guest. Um, I'll give you the floor if you want to close out any final remarks. But um, um, I, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. No, same Neil. No no closing remarks here. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hope you all enjoyed that session. Before we hop into our next round, let's take another break. This one's sponsored by our friends at Microsoft. See you in a few.